We'll give a few minutes more, Kim. Okay, sure. All okay? All settled already? All had breakfast? Do you all have your sahur? Ken? All okay, yeah? Alhamdulillah. Few more days, few more days, guys. Few more days, bless Qadda. Okay. Let's begin, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Kala Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri Wahlun uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh MashaAllah, how are you all today? Good? Who's tired? No, no, no. Only two people. Okay, or two of you can go back at twelve thirty. The rest will stay lah. Okay, until iftar. <laughs> Who's tired? Tired. Who's really tired? Mashallah. Who did kiamulay last night? <laughs> Subhanallah. Okay, last night was twenty seventh night uh, of Ramadan. That means today is our twenty seventh. Of Ramadan, inshallah. Of course, in Singapore, ni lah. In other countries, is a different uh, date. It's okay. And inshallah, for this year, we are only having until 29, 29 days in Ramadan. And so that makes our Hari Raya on Tuesday evening. So on Tuesday evening, don't be shocked, lah. Saza, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saza, yeah. Tuesday evening. So Tuesday evening after Maghrib is when we start our takbir. And then that is our Raya night. And then the next day, we will go to Hari Raya lah, inshaAllah. Alright, your first day of Shawwal. For the first day of Shawwal, we are not allowed to fast. So we cannot fast on the first day of Shawwal. All of us, is not allowed. It's the hukum, the ruling is haram. If anyone say, I'm fasting, I still want to fast. I miss Ramadan so much. I don't want Hari Raya. <laughs> still cannot. Because if you fast, then the ruling is haram. It's a day to celebrate. So for days that have to be celebrated on Eidul Fitri and Eidul Adha, both of these days you cannot fast. Okay? As much as uh, this is a motivational class, Islamic class, I will put in fiqh. I will put in rulings inside. My major in Azhar, Al-Azhar University, I graduate with a diploma in Sharia Islamia. My inclination... I love Quran. I wanted to study Quran, but we couldn't choose. If I take Usuluddin, the dean will not let us choose whether it's Hadith, whether it's Quran, or whether it's Aqidah in our third year. So I didn't want them. I didn't want Hadith. I didn't want Aqidah. I just wanted Quran. So last minute, I changed to Sharia Islamia. All right. 
and I wasn't from a madrasa. I was from, uh, I mean, people study for 12 years, go to Al Azhar. I already studied for two and a half years. So then I got a diploma. So I kind of got, my God, can I, can I really do this? So I took Sharia Islamia. But I guess it's all for a reason. Right now, when I come back uh, to Singapore, the first job I took was uh, in Dar Masjid Aliman when I was holding the niche of uh, Darul Fiqh. So it was all Sharia. So then I realized that Allah made me study Sharia for a reason. Because is Islam is not just about motivation, feel good. No, you need to know the akam. You still need to know how to practice your religion. And this akam, these religion rulings, they are not there to burden us. They are not there to make it difficult. Like this salah, uh, pray five times a day. How many of us still feel that it's actually a burden to us? Right? And because we feel like it's a burden to us, we feel like being a Muslim, and if I be a Muslim 100%, it's going to be very difficult. My life is going to be very difficult. I don't have freedom like those who like perhaps 50% into Islam, one foot in, one foot out. You know, if I'm going to submit myself into Islam, oh man, I've got to pray five times a day, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Wow, it's so hectic. But Sharia is actually a way of life, Islam is a way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us do certain things not to burden us. Allah make us do certain things or everything in Islam because Allah loves us. Why Allah says that khamar, for example, uh, wine or beer is haram for us. Not because Allah hates us, because Allah loves us. Because when we drink something like that, it intoxicates our mind. We, do, we are not able to control our mind and we, are, we might do something that we shouldn't do. And now you see even people say don't drink and drive, right? And people drink and then end up doing things that they're not supposed to do, correct? So when you look at it, there's a lot of hikmah. There's a lot of hikmah why Allah SWT makes certain things haram, why Allah makes certain things halal, why uh, intimacy or sexual intercourse before nikah, uh, an actual uh, uh, sah nikah, um, valid nikah is not allowed. You are like, alama, Islam so fussy, you know, cannot do this, cannot do that. It is for a good reason, isn't it? It's for a good reason. I watch a documentary on a... Yeah, no problem. Okay. I watch a documentary on... There is tribe. There is tribe, which is still existing right now. Which is still existing right now. They, they have this... Um, I forgot, quite some time I watched it. They have this kind of uh, festival every year where the men has to paint their faces and then the men has to show their teeth and the men has to make a dance in front of... Uh, they make a line and they make a dance in front of the women. And uh, it's like when they show their teeth, uh, it's a kind of manliness kind of thing. I don't know. Like, you look handsome kind of thing. So, whatever is it, lah, all right? So, but the ladies got to choose which men they want to marry. Okay, cool, huh? you want to go there? Go to that. <laughs> the ladies get to choose which men they want to marry. And here's the thing, they get to choose different men every year. So this year, they want to marry this man. This man look attractive with the teeth, with the kind, he, he paint his faces and all that, looks, look handsome. Huh? Next year, he can, she can change the husband. So she might have slept with this husband for one year, have a child, have, you know, but the next year is a different husband. So the next year, following year, is a different husband. So at the end of the documentary, they said that there was an issue because of this. Because the children was left with fatherless. Don't know where's the father, because the father keeps changing. The mother is the same, but you know, you have siblings, one mother, the fathers are different and the fathers are not responsible because I'm only your husband for this year. You didn't choose me for the next year, so I'm not your husband anymore. So there's no kind of responsibility towards the child or towards the wife. When I watch the documentary, as much as I respect every, every kind of culture and all that, it, it kind of gives me a deeper appreciation of Islam. Like why Islam says that you cannot have sexual intercourse before a valid nikah. It, it, it really, you know, if you really understand, you appreciate that. 
because we take care of ourselves and we, if any one of us, you just ask anyone, there are people who have sexual intercourse, got pregnant, and they really regret. They really regret. But then they say, Ustazah, it's not fair, you know. In Islam, why do you call the child um, out of wedlock? And then the child cannot bend to the father. Alright, cannot bin. Cannot the father, that means, let's say, Ahmad bin Sulaiman. Can, the Sulaiman is a biological father. But you cannot put the bin there. Because the sexual intercourse happened before the valid nikah. Even if it's one hour before the valid nikah. That's how strict Islam is. Right? But you, if you appreciate the wisdom behind it, you understand. That means people really take it seriously. And Allah SWT really honour women. Like really, if someone is really serious about you, they need to go through your father, they need to have a valid akad, with, uh, you know, a valid akad, and Allah call it mithaqan ghaliza, Allah call it a heavy covenant, it's not any joke, you're taking someone else do- else's daughter as your wife, it's, it's no joke. And you're taking this in the name of Allah. And, and if you really understand that, you know, as I'm talking to you, I have goosebumps, you know, talking. It's, it's really when you appreciate the sharia, you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us very much. You know, and how after a divorce, in fact, after a divorce, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the women's welfare. And Allah told the man that you are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and you cannot hold the woman. Like say, for example, now we see yeah, men who do not want to divorce the wife. Okay? Just because I want to make their life miserable. Because as long as the woman is not divorced, then what happened? She cannot move on with her life, right? Yeah. This is, these are the things that, um, because I'm still doing my 28, 29, 30th juzu. Those of you who get the 10 juzu, give me some time. Huh? Because last week, what happened was after the whole thing, I fall really sick. In fact, I just vomited last night also. I don't know what's happening to my body. My body is a bit crashing down. Thing telling me to just uh, take it slow. So I'm, I'm preparing the slides. And the slides in Surah Talaq. Wah, mashallah. How Allah SWT protect us. And Allah says, if you really want to divorce, then let them go in goodness. Like, even in ending a marriage, it has to be in a good way. Starting the marriage is a good way. You are marrying someone else's daughter, okay, and you are taking this in the name of Allah. Is that you are responsible about this and over this? And when you release them, you have to release them in a good manner. This is all so beautiful, but yet things get messed up. Why? Because Muslims just don't follow Islam. <laughs> but if you really were to follow Islam, the Sharia, everyone's uh, rights will be protected, okay. Just wanted to start off with this, asking you to really appreciate uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sharia, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ahkam, because if you don't appreciate, it's, it's hard when you go against it. It becomes harder for your life. But the, mo- the more you submit to it, the easier your life will be. Do you realize it? It is easier when you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was once one foot in, one foot out also. <laughs> Like, uh, you know, take a bit lah, you know, YOLO, you only live once, like, I'm not ready for this. When I was in secondary school, I wasn't ready to wear hijab full-time. Like, why should I? I got nice hair. Like, why should I wear hijab? I was one foot in, one foot out. Still going for study groups and all that without my hijab. Still praying, like, nobody's business. If I don't get my subo, then fine. I'll just pray later. <laughs> so it's like, no big deal. I was, I was at that path once upon a time, and I believe that all of us, we have that experience, right? That I didn't come from a family of Asatiza. I, we weren't strict. I was just talking to my parents, and my parents said, yeah, last time we were all not strict. You know, not, not like now. The, what, I know how we implement Islam in our family. All of us start somewhere. All of us start somewhere. But the moment you see it as not a burden, Becomes easier for you. So after this Ramadan, many of us have to do Qadok. Right? Some of us, I think most of us, we won't get 30 days or 29 days of Ramadan. It's okay. And uh, we can Qadok, right? So as much as you can, inshallah, try to do your Qadok. Try to finish it up. Alright? Try to finish it up so that you won't procrastinate, you won't delay it. So inshallah, you have to do Qadok. Now there's a Sharia of Islam. 
Correct? You have to do. That becomes a burden to you. Oh man, everybody's eating kuih. Everybody's eating the ketupat, uh, lode, and I cannot fast and all that. Uh, I, I cannot eat. If you really understand that these six days or these seven days or these eight days that you need to call up is something that brings benefit to you, you are not losing out, then it doesn't become a burden to you. Whenever you fast and other people are eating, it doesn't become a burden to you because you know, you know that this is something good for me. All right? So that's why our perspective towards Sharia has to be very different. The moment you think as solat as a burden, it becomes a burden. Taraweeh as a burden, burden lah. Okay, my friends are still in uh, Masjidil Haram, Makkah. I came back already. Two of them are still there. One of them in the team, right? One of them are still there. And they showed me the, the crowd at Masjidil Haram. Subhanallah, subhanallah. What takes five minutes from the mosque to go to the hotel in usual time, now take one hour from the mosque to the hotel because you really cannot walk. When I was there, it was 16 Ramadan, it was already crowded. And now I cannot imagine. And then I saw videos in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Subhanallah, how many thousand? How many? I saw just 20,000, is it? 20 or 200,000, I don't know. So many people at Masjid Al-Aqsa. When I was there, it was not that crowded. Subhanallah. But to think about it, it's really a struggle lah, a struggle. But every step you take one hour eh, just to go there, subhanAllah. So, may Allah bless those people who are already there and doing ibadah there, inshaAllah. Yesterday, I was with Siti Nualiza and she was saying that um, she was supposed to go Umrah. She used to go Umrah every Ramadan. But this Ramadan, she didn't go because she had to come here. Okay. So I was like, wow, amazing. Every Ramadan, no, she go. For me, right, I think I don't think I have that, that sabr to go for akhir Ramadan. Do you have that sabr? Because you know why? My friend was telling me, for you to get taraweh prayers in the mosque, Masjid Haram, you need to be at the mosque from Zuhur prayer. I repeat. <laughs> For you to be in the mosque for taraweh prayers, you need to be at the mosque from Zohor prayers. And I was like, what? And for them to pray Jumaah prayers, last Jumaah, because I was messaging them and they didn't reply. I needed to know something. Then they said, we were there from even uh, before 8 o'clock. You know, subhanallah, just for Friday prayers. So, and I asked my mom, because my mom usually go for... Uh, Umrah Ramadan This year she didn't go Because I, did, I didn't let her I said Every time Hari Raya You're not here So stay here <laughs> I want to go to your house So she's going for Shawwal Then I asked her She said yeah I will stay from Subo She said from Subo She will stay in the mosque All the way Until Iftar Then I asked her You know go toilet then she was like, no, I didn't go to toilet lah because it's fasting and all that. But she was stay all the way. After iftar, then she will go back. Then I was like, wow, amazing. Amazing, ah, mashallah. For me, I still haven't go to that level lah. I go to Salat Jumaat down there, 10 o'clock already. By 12 o'clock, I need to go to the toilet already. Correct or not? Yeah, that's one of our... And the toilet there are really fast, subhanallah. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm, t- I'm telling you that those people who are there, they are really, mashallah... The, the patients they, they have there So Alhamdulillah So let's move on to the topic today Today inshallah I'm going to talk to you about um, How to How to Live Life With people Or in an, a toxic environment Right Sometimes we Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us in situation where people around us, they really test us to our limit. Okay? And these people can be the people very close to us. So in page uh, 14, you have the story of Ayub. The story of Ayub, and then uh, Nabi Ayub said, eh, it's not the, sorry, wrong page. Where is it? 
don't know which page already. Okay, you have the page, uh, the story of uh, Nabi Yaqub alaihi salam. Nabi Yaqub alaihi salam, he had twelve sons, correct? And out of the twelve sons, he had two wives. Two sons came from one wife, ten sons from the other wife. The last two weeks when I was at Masjid Aqsa, he went to visit the makam of Nabi Ibrahim and the wife Sarah. And just at the, the other side is actually Nabi Yaqub's makam. All right? But we are not able to see it because that mosque is the same mosque where you saw at um, Instagram where they were playing music and all that in the mosque. That's the same mosque, Masjid Ibrahim. So we went there. So what happened was because of um, something that happened there, they divided the mosque. So half of it was for the Muslims and half of it was for the Jews. So the Nabi Ibrahim is of course, Ju uh, Judaism is also an Abrahamic faith. So you can see that Nabi Ibrahim Makom, half of it, there's a window for the Muslims to see and there's another window for the Jews to see. So the makam was in the middle of the mosque. The mosque is uh, divided into two. So half of it was for the Muslim, half of it was for the Jews. And the makam itself, one window, I saw the window. There's one window that the Jews can see the uh, makam of Nabi Ibrahim. And there's one window for the Muslims to see. It was very interesting. So makam Nabi Yaqub was at the other side. We couldn't see. Right, because uh, it's only open during Isra and Mi'raj for 10 days, so we couldn't see. So we could only see this part, this side. Um, Yusuf alayhi salam makam was here also at, at our side. So when you see Nabi Yaqub alayhi salam, every time I talk about Nabi Yaqub and Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, Nabi Yaqub is the father of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. And every time I talk about them, it always reminds me that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put us in situation where people will not be easy with us. And these people might be family. Because Nabi Yaqub is being tested with 10 sons. And these 10 sons wanted to get rid of the one son, Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. And he is also tested with these 10 sons taking his son, Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, away and they told the father that he was killed all right, by a wolf. Do you remember the story in um, Surah Yusuf? Can you imagine the father? He loved the son and he got the news that the son was killed, but he knows that it's not the truth. Because when they produced to him, they show him the shirt of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam and they smear it with blood. Nabi Yaqub alayhi salam knows that it's fake. Because number one, if he is eaten by a wolf, then the shirt would have been ripped off, would have been torn. But the shirt was not torn. So being an intelligent man, being an intelligent man, he knows that that is not the truth. And he knows that these ten sons of his has something against this Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. He knows that. And yet he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have only you to complain about to my worry. Innama ashku bati wa huzni ilallah. I only have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complain to about my sadness and about my bati, my, my grief, my, my anguish, my, the feeling that I feel. So this Nabi Yaqub alayhi salam has taught me a lot of things. Even the people closest to us might not understand us. They might not understand us. You look at Nabi Lut, Nabi Noh, their wives. Did their wives understand them? No. In Surah At-Tahrim, Allah guaranteed the wife of Nabi Lut and Nabi Noh, all right, two of these ladies, to, they, Allah guaranteed them a place in Jahannam, a place in the hellfire. And Allah said that even though their, their, their husbands were prophets, it does not help them. It is not beneficial to them because they did not enter Islam. So it doesn't matter. So you see that um, even Nabi Noh and Nabi Lut, their tests were their wives. It's not easy. They were prophets, you know. 
Nabi Noh, the test with the son. The son did not want to listen to him. Can you imagine how he feels? Nabi Ibrahim alaihi salam. What was his biggest test? Nabi Ibrahim alaihi salam. His father, isn't it? His father was someone who made idols. He's someone, I know, someone who sell the idols, who believe in uh, worshipping the idols. And here, Nabi Ibrahim is telling the father, you know, Ya Abati, oh my dear father, why are you doing this? Worship Allah. And the father scolded him. The father scolded him. So his test is his father. So if you see the prophets in the Quran, like Nabi Yaqub, Nabi Yusuf, his siblings, all right? Nabi Noh, Nabi Lut, you, you look at them and you realize that the people where Allah SWT test us with, sometimes they are family. They are family. But Allah chose them for us. You see, families are not something that we can choose. You can choose your spouse, but you cannot choose your parents. Can you choose your parents? Says, uh, Allah, I don't like, uh, delete, drag. Put, you know, delete this parent, change. Can you, de- can you do that? When you were young, do you, maybe perhaps when you were young, you see some other cool parents just like, how I wish my parents like that. Have you thought about it like that? How I wish my parents like that, so cool. My mother, 10 o'clock, only must come back. <laughs> Got curfew. Maybe perhaps you think of it like that. But it's Allah SWT chose your mother for you. Allah SWT chose your father for you. Allah SWT chose your siblings for you. Allah SWT chose how you are the number one in the family. The first one, the second one, the third one. Sometimes you know you tell yourself, I hate being the first one in the family. It's always me. I have to do everything. Right? How many of you feel that way? Yes? Right? Or I hate being the youngest in the family. You know? Anyone hate being the youngest? No lah. Youngest, everybody love, right? Oh, you hate being the youngest? I thought the youngest is the most pampered. <laughs> is it? So, Hana, get away with everything. No. Ah. No. Ah. Oh, the youngest is the one who's always bullied. Is it? Yes. Oh, mashallah. Is it? For me, I have four. My youngest one bullied the other three. <laughs> My Nusaiba, <laughs> I named her Nusaiba after the warrior princess. Not warrior princess lah. Warrior... Uh, sahaba, the companion Nusaiba bin Dika'ab, who's very brave, and she turned out to be very brave. <laughs> okay, so Nusaiba turns out to be really a warrior. <laughs> Subhanallah. So name your daughter properly lah. But Nusaiba, mashallah lah. She's she's brave. She's actually a mini version of me. So when I look at her, I was like, I cannot blame her lah. She has my genes. So. But, you know, sometimes we blame ourselves. Ah, oh, I hate to be the middle, the middle child. Who's the middle child here? Anyone middle child? Eh, not, then you're number what? Eh? Number seven, number eight. <laughs> middle child. Heard of the middle child syndrome? Have you heard of the middle child syndrome? Is it true? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> middle child syndrome. Middle child... I'm a middle child, okay? And my husband is also a middle child, okay? That's why we understand each other a lot. Middle child, both, middle child, they say, very stubborn. But I choose to say they are very determined. You know, teachers, you know, teachers down here, you don't say stubborn, right? Yeah, you twist the word, smart. My husband is the teacher. So my husband said, every time we do report cards, we cannot say the child is stubborn, the child is lazy. Cannot use these words. You need to use, if he's stubborn, if he's stubborn, you say the child is determined. So if you're a teacher, you read, you know your child is actually stubborn, but then the teacher is right, determined. Uh, so I said, oh, really? Yeah? yeah, nowadays you have to write positive things, not the negative version. Last time, our teachers goring us like, don't know what, your child. Ah. Okay, so. Um, so I, I choose to think that second child is determined, Che. Se- second child, uh, the willpower is very strong, isn't it? Right? Uh, stubborn, I don't know lah, maybe to some of you, but yeah, I'm, a, I'm stubborn in some things, which is true. I'm the middle child. My sister is more flexible than me. My sister follows my mother more than me, like whatever my mom says. My younger one also follow, the, the, my younger sister also very flexible, but I'm the 
my way. But it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing in some ways. I mean, like, I wanted to switch uh, the, my line to Islamic line. My parents were not, didn't allow in the first place. So I was determined. <laughs> if I didn't have that stubbornness, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out. So it's a good thing. But middle child syndrome, all right? And middle child, sometimes the first one get the attention, the last one get the attention, the middle one is sandwich. No attention, correct or not? So when I live my life, I realized that I didn't have much attention. Then I, as I grew up, I thought my parents didn't love me. But when I grew older, then I realized it's because my mother think that I can do it on my own. Okay, she see me as independent. Even when I have children, I take care of my own children, so my parents look at me as independent. So if I don't change my perspective and I feel like my parents don't care about me, if until now I keep th thinking that my parents don't care about me, my parents is not giving me attention, then it's going to hurt me. It's going to hurt me because I cannot change anyone, but I can change my perspective. I can change the way I look at things. So I change the way I look at things. I look at it as, oh, my parents look at me because I did have a talk with my mother. Ma, why you more like, I feel like she's more concerned about my sister. I talked to her. She was like, no, because I see you very independent, you and her husband. So I was like, oh, okay. Then I got it. I, I, I understand. So I look at it positively now. My mom looks at me as an independent lady. All right? So there are some things in life you cannot change. You cannot change the way your parents show you love. Some mothers are just tough love. Right? Never say, I love you to you. Then you are dying down here. Ma, say, I love you. Say, I love you. They just cannot change. All right? I think the old-timer parents, right? They don't say, I love you to you. But if you, you turn and you change and look at it at a different perspective, you'll find it's easier to understand that person. Perhaps your parents also go, um, they have an emotional baggage. They have parents who don't say, I love you towards them. Then they don't know how to stop that, you know, um, you call it a generational trauma. They don't know how to stop that thing. So they do the same thing towards you. You have parents who, their parents beat them up. So they don't know how. Why is my mother and my sister calling me now? I think they know I'm talking about them. <laughs> my sister only said, my sister and I are very close ah, because we are two years apart. My younger sister, 10 years apart. Wait, then my later I call her. Um, what was I saying? Ah, generational trauma. So there are certain things that they don't, they don't know. Perhaps they don't like it, but they don't know how else to, to behave. And so they continue the same thing that their parents do to them. All right? Now, we have to change our perspective. So when you change that perspective, you understand that our parents are not perfect. We can have narcissistic parents. We can have parents who show us tough love. We can have parents who don't care about us. But Allah SWT chose us to be in that household. Allah SWT chose them as our parents. And there is a reason why we are put there. All right? So look at it in a perspective that how can I grow from this? What kind of lesson can I learn from this? How can I be stronger from this? You might be coming from an abusive you know, relationship or abusive parents, all right? It's not easy to forgive them. It's not easy to forgive them. But at the end of the day, Allah put you in that family for a reason also. Okay, I'm not telling you to tolerate abusive parents. Any abusive relationship, you need to come out from it. Okay, parents, spouses, even children beating up parents. There are cases where children beat up parents. They are, all right? where the child is um, beating up the mother and the mother thinks that it's okay. It happens. And I know of people who endured because this is my child. This is not, this is not, this should not be tolerated. Okay, if your child is beating you up, that is not normal. I know of grandparents being beaten up by their grandchildren. This is not this is not it's supposed to be tolerated. Never mind, uh, it's just a child. No. Islam has never asked us to tolerate. Even for spouses. Even for wife beating up husband. There are cases, you know, domestic abuse. Not only husband beat up wife. There are wife who beat up husband. I spoke to people who are experts in this. They, was like, they are, they are uh, a small number compared to husband uh, abusing wife. But they are wife who beat up the husband. I was like, wow, amazing, mashallah. But um, 
Also, you talk about abuse, there's emotional abuse, psychological abuse also. And they are ladies, they are wives who abuse their husband, perhaps not physically, but mentally, or psychologically, or emotionally. I give an example. Husband come back only, she start her nagging. Nag, 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 all the way. All right? And then, every time the husband come back, she nags. Every time the husband come back, she nags. This is not normal. This is not normal. This is something, I know you all said wife must nag. Some people even use um, the story of Omar ibn Khattab being patient with the wife nagging. So we said, oh, okay, this is a ticket for me to nag. <laughs> so I can nag. The wife can nag. But as a wife, myself, this is an advice to all ladies down there, I know there's a lot of things that we can nag. But control ourselves. Control ourselves. Because our husband has an emotional tank also. And we need to fill up the emotional tank with positivity. Too much nagging. What happened? Too much nagging. The husband might not want to come back also because there's no, there's no peace. So there's Sakina at home. There's Sakina at home. This is something that so I have to remind all of you. Okay, sometimes we also need to look inside ourselves. I look inside myself. This Ramadan, I really look inside. Sometimes I nag. Sometimes I'm tired, right? What we do? Nag. Then I realize when my mood change, the whole family's mood change. Correct? Do you realize that? How many of you realize that? The rest of you? Your mood depends on the children. Your mood depends on no mood, lah, Ustazah. <laughs> Go back home, no mood. Okay? So then I realized that when I come back home, I need to make it a positive one. Okay? And when, it, when I'm frustrated, then I need to talk to my children and tell my husband that I am frustrated. I am in this frustration mood. I'm in this mood. So they know how to handle, okay, this, I'm, I'm in this frustration mood. Okay, Umi is frustrated over something. Okay? Uh, even for my daughter, even for my son, when they, were in, they are in a kind of a mode, right? Then we know, okay, they are in this mode. How do we talk to them? Even for husbands, they have their own mode. They have the tired mode. They have their, I don't know what mode. What else mode? Sorry? Clingy? Claim? Crave? Cave. See, create cave in their own work. Oh, yeah, yeah. Men got their caves. <laughs> They got their boxes. When they are something, you don't disturb them. Uh, so they, 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 are, they are in the, they are, you know, these kind of things. So, I guess that's where we learn about each other. Lah. Marriage is about learning about each other. What do you need? What do I need? Why do we do this? You know, why do you do that? SubhanAllah. So, these are things that we still are learning, but we need to reflect on ourselves. So, sometimes we think that the other party is toxic, but we don't realize that the toxic, the toxicity is actually coming from us. We don't realize that. Okay? So, one of it is the nagging part. Lah. One of it is the nagging part. If you want your husband to change, you want your husband to pray, if you nag a lot, your husband will not pray. Correct? When I ask my husband, what's the one thing you don't like? I don't like uh, nagging, I don't like scolding. Then he said, all men are like that. I was like, oh, okay. So they don't like. And when you nag, right, even if you correct, sometimes it sounds like nagging to them. All right? So what do you like? Oh, I like this. I like to be pampered. I like to be this. Husband, in front of their wife, they become a child. Okay, they become a child. However manly they are, they can only show that they are a child in front of their wife. Correct? So that's the part where we need to take care of them. We need to take care of them. And this is very beautiful. We see this in the life of the Prophet also. So maybe perhaps this Ramadan, try to go back. If my marriage is not working, if I've been married for so long and there's no happiness in the marriage, how can I make that change? How can I make it a pleasant one? How can I want to go home and see my husband? How can I feel like whenever I hear the keys, not K-I-S-S, huh? K-E-Y-S. <laughs> when I hear the keys, Ramadan, huh? okay? When I hear the keys, I am happy that my husband is back. Not that I'm like, oh, my husband is back. Now I'm dreading his presence at home. How do you change that? So sometimes things change from us. 
We cannot change others, but the ripple effect can start from us in the family. It can start from us, even for our children. If your children is not listening, okay, I'm a mother, I have four kids. My one kid is a teenager, 14 years old. Another one is a 12 year old, coming up, twin, teenager. <laughs> so if your kids, they have certain things, right? Like they are in their own world sometimes. What are the things that you can do from yourself to make the change, the ripple effect? Instead of expecting them to make the change. Because we can make the ripple effect. We can. We can change others from just making this ripple. It might not, much, it might not be much, but we have to only start from ourselves. Okay? Even for our parents. Our parents who are... Perhaps you have parents who are... Like say, do not say I love you to you. And you feel like, why my mother is not saying I love you? Why my father is like that? You know, why my parents are not like other people? Find out what's their love language. And then you feed them through their love language. You will feel very fulfilled. And try to understand that, oh, from their point of view, you will feel very fulfilled. Okay? Of course, there are some things that you cannot understand. Lah. There are some things that you are... It's beyond your... Even to understand, comprehend why your parents did that. Like, for example, the one I shared with you. Did I share with you here? The two-year-old girl who was uh, abused and then put inside a pot. Did I share with you in this class? The, the parents put them inside a pot and the parents burned her. And then they put her under the sink for many years until the body decomposed. And then they put her in the box, in the pot, in the box. And then she was uh, found, the body was found by her uncle many, many years later, about 10 years later, I think. Yeah. Do you, have you heard the news that was last year? Was it an easy thing? It's not an easy thing. And when I met the guardian, the guardian told me that the other siblings still cannot find it in their heart to meet the mother. Cannot find it in their heart. And is it understandable? It is understandable. Because this is traumatizing, you know. Traumatizing. One of your siblings is killed by your parent. One of your siblings is killed by your parent. How do you actually face your parent, okay, unless your parent really taubat, like, okay, I'm, I, 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 I regret over whatever I do. Then perhaps we can open up our heart to actually forgive and forget. Not even forget, lah, but forgive and overlook. I only say we cannot forget. If we lose our mind, then we can forget. But we can always overlook people's mistake. All right? So, and Islam has always taught us to forgive and overlook. All right? Why overlook? Because you can never forget that that person has done something to you and it's, it hurts. All right? But you can overlook and say that everybody does a mistake and that is your mistake and I overlook. And that is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, right? He met Wahshi. The, someone who killed his uncle Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib uh, at the Battle of Uhud. All right? But when Al Wahshi came to him on the conquest of Makkah and he entered Islam, the Prophet accepted him. The Prophet did not say, It was because of you, no, you killed my uncle, you know. You are, I can forgive you, lah, but <laughs> if you ask, we say, right, I can forgive you, but you know what you did to me, not. But no, the Prophet ﷺ forgive him. Right? That means he forgive, he did not forget, but he overlook. That is what is being taught to us. But there are some things that is difficult to overlook. When you are sexually abused by your father, when you are raped by your father, is it easy to overlook? Is it easy to overlook? It's not easy to overlook. And I've spoken personally to someone who has gone through this, but that person said, I need to overlook because... I'm doing it for myself. I'm doing it for myself. So it's doable, but it's not easy. Okay? But what I want to tell you is that when you are faced with these toxic people around you, number one, you need to have boundaries. You need to have boundaries. Okay? They are our personal space, our safe space. We still need to have boundaries. There are certain things that people cannot do to us. And you have to understand that, even our own spouse. All right? And if they cross that boundaries, then you have every right to seek help and to say no, even with our own spouse. 
even with our own spouse. Some people think that, oh, okay, in Islam, we marry our husband, Sami'ana wa ata'na. We hear, we listen, and we obey. Yes, yes. Whatever husband said, yes, yes. Uh, and some even think that a good wife is someone who just say yes to the husband. If you say no to the husband, you go to hell. <laughs> you have to say na- wa- yes, yes, yes to your husband. Is that the truth? No, that's not the truth. Can you say no to the husband? You can say no to the husband. Okay? So, in fact, there are issues like people ask, so if the husband wants sexual intercourse, and I say no, because I'm so tired, Ustaza, is it wrong? No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. But the hadith, my husband produced one hadith in front of me and said that if you say no, the malaikat will curse you until morning. Have you heard of that? The malaikat will curse you until morning. Okay? But if you really understand, the Prophet wasallam always teach the men to always have foreplay with the women. Correct? To make the women want to do. And if you, if you really understand the Prophet wasallam towards his wife, the, the way he treats his wife, the wife themselves is more than happy to actually serve the Prophet wasallam. Correct? But sometimes if you treat your wife like slaves and you treat your wife like rubbish and then when you want it, you just ask for it, the wife is not, not able to give it to you. Right? So if you study about this, you realise that women... We, the moment we are treat, treated in a nice way, our, uh, that's where our feminine side will come out and that's when we will. We are more than willing to be able to engage in such acts with our husbands. Okay? So all this is very comprehensive, lah, very holistic, how Islam teach us that it's not just about husband one, give me. But the whole day the husband has been calling the wife... Um, you so slow lah, so fat lah, so horrible lah. I regret marrying you lah. I, I wish I would have divorced you lah. Look at your stomach, look at your body. The whole day he's been telling that. Then at night, suddenly he say, uh, you must give me. <laughs> How can the woman be even turned on and just, you know, um, sleep with the husband? So Islam has never taught that. Islam has taught you to look at things in a bigger, bigger picture. That you need to treat your wife in a way your wife is happy to even be with you. Okay? Alright. So that's about toxicity. First thing I told you about have boundaries. Okay? Have boundaries with your husbands, with your children. Also, you have to have boundaries. Uh, even in etiquettes of aurat, you need to have boundaries with your children. There's a mother who asked me. I was teaching a puberty class. The mother told me that uh, I am still bathing with my child. My daughter is eight years old. All right? And I'm still bathing with her. And I teach her the body parts while I bathe her. Okay? And she asked me, is it permissible? I said, no, it's not permissible. Even though she's your daughter. Because when she's eight years old, she understands about our right. And your eight-year-old daughter also has our right. That, that there are certain things that you cannot see from your child unless there is a need to do so. All right? And how old is that? By the time that child is about three years old, the child already know about all right. So you are not, when your child is three years old, you cannot dress or undress in front of your child. Your child three years old, three years old only, three years old know a lot of things. <laughs> okay, three years old know a lot of things. So you need to have boundaries ready. So Islam teach us to have boundaries. Not that, ah, never mind lah, it's my son only one, my son 21 years old. Eh? 21 years old, <laughs> no boundaries. No, they must have boundaries. Okay? And as Islam teach us these boundaries, it's telling us that these boundaries keep us safe. Even for fathers and children. You need to have boundaries or not? You need to have boundaries. You need to have aurat or not? Aurat, in front of my father, I cannot be wearing something, a short skirt or something, or bermudas or something, because it's my father. Or in front of my son also, I cannot be dressing up like that. All right? So these are called boundaries. Okay? So when always, always have these boundaries and ensure that people respect the boundaries. I give, I give you another example of boundaries. Uh, in-laws. In-laws. Okay? When you are married, you need to have boundaries. 
the, your in-laws and your parents cannot interfere in some things that is personal between you and your husband. And when I say personal, it includes things like decisions that you make for your children also. There are some in-laws, uh, I have a friend, Ustaz Shakir, Ustaz Shakir Pasunis in ROMM. So he was sharing that there are some in-laws that interfere in a way that they even want to decide which school the grandchild goes in or what name. Right? Have you heard of this? Have you seen this? I've seen this. The in-law want the name this. I've been wanting this name. They like this name. But they cannot put the name for their child. Because their in-laws put the name for the child. So now they hold on to the name. And then they said, I want the child's name to be this name. Okay? Don't put other name. This name is good. But the parents perhaps do not want that name. Alright, so there are issues like that. People come to me, Ustaza, I don't want this name. But my mother-in-law asked me to put this name. What, what name does your mother-in-law ask to put? She asked to put Zainab, Fatima. Now these kids, they don't put Fatima, Zainab. They put uh, Kalisha, uh, what, uh? Christina, uh, Inshira, Maria, correct? All the names, sorry, uh, Inshira down here. Uh. Inshira, but you have two names, uh. sometimes got two names. Even my daughter asked me, why you never put for me two names? Uh, so you have to understand, I know you want to have like Sayyidatina Zainab, Sayyidatina Maryam. It's a good name. By the end of the day, the children, once our children are married, okay, they have their own, uh, we need to respect them as adults. And as much as we want, we can advise them. We cannot uh, impose on them that this is a certain thing that you need to follow. This is my style. We need to understand that they are a family on their own. Okay? The moment you understand this, they will also respect you. And I'm telling myself also, like my children are going to get married, right? They're going to have their own spouse. And whatever name, even my daughter asked me now, Umi, what name do you want my child uh, to have? I said, now you ask me, later when you have husband, you decide, love like, your husband, whatever name you want. Oh, I want this name, this name, this name. Okay, uh, it's your child. Yeah, whatever, whatever name you want with your husband. Okay, as long as it's a good name. Okay, so if you understand that, you have boundaries. That means in-laws have boundaries. Parents have boundaries towards their married children. Okay, things will be very healthy. But the moment people cross the boundaries, okay, that's when things become a bit you know, difficult. Even as a daughter-in-law, you also need to have boundaries, but sometimes you need to have flexibility. Flexibility. This is not boundaries. Flexibility as in, uh, you have a mother-in-law who is sick. Alright? And then, you, you do not want your husband to, you know, visit your mother or the mother-in-law every day. Or you don't want your privacy, you don't want your mother-in-law to come to your house. Uh, that means you are not it is my boundary, this is my boundary. Your mother cannot come to my house. Islam said you need to give me one house. I don't care if your mother is sick. Put your mother in the nursing home. Huh. You are so bothered about the boundaries. No. If let's say this kind of things happen, you need to be flexible. Because at the end of the day, that is his mother. And when that is his mother, then he has his responsibility towards the mother. Okay, so these are boundaries, and boundaries are very important. Allah SWT talk about boundaries in the Quran. Allah says, Still kahududullah. These are the boundaries, limitations that Allah has given. And Allah has taught us that we need to have boundaries. Who to salam, who not to salam. Hari Raya is coming, right? Who can you salam? This uncle can salam or not? This uncle cannot salam. Correct or not? Do you know that there are some uncles who cannot salam? Or all the uncles you salam? Uncle Unila. Look like Uncle Uso Salam Unila. I don't know who Uso Salam. Last time I used to be like that when I was young. Don't know who, right? Elderly, just Salam. Uncles who are your parents' siblings, uncles who are your parents' brothers, you can Salam them. Uncles who marry into the family, that means your aunties, your parents' sisters, married the men, that uncle you cannot Salam. That uncle is not your mahram. Okay? And it's not easy to make the change. When I made the change, 
some of my uncles not happy as so. You like my daughter, no? You think what? I say, I know, I know, I know. But very difficult. But after a while, they understood lah. Okay? At the end of the day, Allah's ahkam, Allah's ruling comforts. And sometimes when you do try to follow the rulings of Allah, not everybody can understand, but it's okay. But alhamdulillah, at the end of the day, people understand. Alright? Cousins are not your mahram. Cousins, however you are with them, like siblings, they are still not your mahram. So when you meet them, can you salam them? You cannot salam them. Uh, cousins can marry, you know. I know some of you like, eee, cousins marry. I saw eee. Because we all like siblings, right? We all play with each other. We know each other's habit, you know. Hey, I don't want to marry my cousin, but cousins can marry each other. Maternal or paternal. Because there are some culture who believe that cousins cannot marry. My culture, even I'm an Indian, right? For Indian, my father, my father's brother has son. Uh, so my father's brother's son cannot marry me, according to the culture. Why? Because they are brothers and brothers. Brothers and brothers, the blood very strong. So his son cannot marry me. So there are some culture like that. And I said, no, you can marry me, actually. <laughs> because we are not brothers and sisters. We are cousins. Okay? So these are things that Allah SWT put, not to make things difficult for us, but to make things easy for us. Okay? So, even for... Uh, children, the boundaries that we have towards children is that when the children make decision in their life, sometimes they are not happy about it, right? But as mothers, we need to also respect that they have their own mind, correct? They have their own taste. My daughter is 14 years old. He has his, she has her own taste of clothes. I might not like it, but she likes it. Okay, halas. Alright, ahlan, whatever, whatever hijab she's putting, she's putting a hijab. Her hijab is like, you know those nowadays hijab covering the eye, the flapping one? Uh -huh. That's like, Nabisa, I cannot see your eye. But that's the, I feel very, uh, I know that kind of thing, but she feels it's, it's nice. Alhamdulillah, as long as she likes it, alhamdulillah. So you can read, it's, it's whatever her taste is. Even yesterday, I brought her after the dinner with Siti Noaliza. I said, okay, la, let's go to uh, buy some clothes. So we went to Ryan Couture. We went there. She picked her own dress. Okay, it looks nice. You like this? Yeah, I like this. Okay. Nusaiba, she picked another dress. But even Nusaiba, but the same color. Okay. Uh, my dress, I pick. Lah. You don't get to pick for me. <laughs> right? My husband chose one dress for me, I didn't like. I said, no, I don't like it. And my husband respected that. He doesn't force me to wear something that I'm not comfortable with. I said, no, I don't like this because it shows my figure. I don't like this. I wear something that I like. Okay. So even for husband and wife, we need to have some respect. We need to have some kind of boundaries. You cannot like, I'm your husband. You wear what I want. Uh -huh. No, Islam has never taught us like that. Okay? All right. Anyone has any questions for now? Anyone has any questions? Today is our last session here. And Masjid Al Falah, Al Falah Mosque, has asked me to continue this session uh, after Raya. Not now, lah. Hari Raya, nobody wants to come. Sunday. Sunday, who wants to come? Sunday, nobody wants to come because it's open house. It's uh, going out. I so won't come. <laughs> okay. So, but I'm I still yet to give a final, final, final decision to Ustaz Hanan. Uh, perhaps I do not know whether it's um, practical for me. And also it's a Sunday morning. And my, I told you, my body is like telling me, hey, 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 <laughs> you know, take it slow. So, Wallahu alam. Yeah, got one more question. Okay, can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you are shy to ask a question, you can just write a letter to me. Then, uh, so now I want to ask you, how many of you want to have this kind of sessions after Shawwal, not after Ramadan? How many of you, okay, ask don't want, huh? <laughs> okay. How many of you don't want to have this kind of session after Shawwal? 
Nobody dares to pick up a hand, raise up the hand. How many of you don't know? Any? How many of you think that Sunday is a bit too difficult, a hassle? How many of you think that Friday night is better? Tired. How many of you think that Saturday morning is better? No, children, kids, all their whatever is on Saturday morning. How many of you think that this is the perfect time? Hands up. Okay, uh, I mark attendance. Uh. I'm going to take picture. Uh. If after Shawal we continue this class, you'll never come. <laughs> I'll tag you. <laughs> okay? Whatever is it, I will confirm with you, inshallah. Um, but if we do, we do continue, inshallah, perhaps, uh, I do not know whether it will be... How many of you prefer weekly? Hands up. Weekly. Bi-weekly. Bi-weekly. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Also can. How many of you? Three weeks once. Three weeks once, four weeks once, every month. Monthly? Monthly? Once a year? <laughs> no? So most of you prefer bi-weekly? Huh? Bi-weekly. Weekly. Okay, again, weekly, hands up. Bi-weekly. Yeah. Huh? As long as got class, okay. Ah, all right, okay. Inshallah. So at least I got a poll. Ah. Let's say it's a call a poll. Ah. I did another poll online uh, whether to go Umrah. Ah, Mekah, Madina, Aqsa. Mekah, Madina only or Aqsa only. After I do the poll, I become more confused. <laughs> there were more than 1,000 response. Subhanallah. And most of you actually chose Mekah, Madina, Aqsa. Okay, uh, then the next one was Aqsa only, alright? So I had to make a decision uh, and I was so confused, but Alhamdulillah, thanks to the poll, I made a decision. Okay, so... Cheng -neng -neng. <laughs> How many of you want to go? End of this year. Uh, so... <laughs> end of, I, one of the issues about Mad Makkah, Madina, Madina, Makkah, Aqsa, eh? Madina, Makkah, Aqsa, is um, tired. A lot of people say tired. And yes, it is tiring. I won't deny that. I went for a humanitarian trip at Jordan. We went Mafraq. We came back. And then I went for Aqsa. And then I went for Umrah Ramadan. My legs <laughs> was like, Ugh. because Aqsa, you need to climb up the steps and you need to go down. And Aqsa is not, the, the hotel is not near. Even the nearest hotel is far. Okay? But um, it's, it's tiring. Lah. And, and my mother also said it is tiring because she Otambu, uh, Aqsa, Madina, she have went twice or so. But then I realized, I told Allah, Ya Allah, guide me, Ya Allah, what is the best thing? Then I realized, Hajj is even more tiring. <laughs> Hajj is, subhanallah, Hajj is really you have to walk a lot. There's nothing like if you compare Hajj, walking in Hajj and walking for Mecca, Madinah, Aqsa, this is nothing compared to Hajj. Nothing seriously. How we have to walk, we go to Mina, from Arafah, from Mina, from Mina, from Mina we walk all the way to Jamra, Jamra Aqaba, and then for the next three days, we need to walk again, go back to Mina, come back, uh, throw the, the, uh, the stone, and then come back again, and then come back again. Ah, subhanallah, I tell you. I don't know where I found the okay. Uh, I don't know where I found the strength in during Hajj, but whenever I see the because during Hajj I was one of the younger one, I was only thirty nine. Then the rest were machi machi, right? The one that really made me move on is seeing the machi machi. <laughs> if they can do it, then I cannot complain. <laughs> just go, just go, Bismillah. But Subhanallah, it's really mashallah. So because of that, inshallah, I've decided to go to all three. Okay, I've decided to go to all three, inshallah. So we are going to Madinah, Makkah, and Aqsa. Madinah first, then Makkah. No, 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 no. Makkah first. Then that means we go to Umrah first, settle our Umrah. Then relax at Madinah, and then we go Aqsa. It's better. Because when you go to Madinah first, then Makkah, then immediately Aqsa, you don't have time to rest. 
Because uh, Madinah is a bit relaxing, you just go to Rauda. So, inshallah, we're going to Mecca first. So, we will do our Umrah and then we do our Madinah, our Ziarah at uh, Rauda and uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Maqam and Kuburan. And then we will go to Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, then we are done. Huh? Dates. Uh, we wait uh, for that. Okay. So, I had to make a choice. There are a lot of people who proposed dates to me from other agencies, but I've chosen one, Alhamdulillah. And chosen one that I really believe in. Uh, okay. And I trust. So, uh, the dates will come out, inshallah, soon, very soon. And... <laughs> Um, yeah, but I'm just telling you all uh, three dates. So to those of you who want to go, maybe you can block for you to go all these three dates, three places. You need 15 days, five days at Medina. Eh, sorry, five days at Mecca, five days at Medina, five days at Aqsa. Because if you go lesser than that, you don't feel it. You feel very tired. Three, three, three days, you feel very tired. Okay, so please do block your dates. When I don't know about 15 days. <laughs> okay, so who want to go? Hands up. Wanna go? One, two, three, four. Okay, five. Good. Six, seven. Okay, ah. Uh. You better wait, ah. Uh, inshallah, uh. we go. I'm excited to go, inshallah. So hopefully we can go. And if there's a lot of people, then I do need to bring another ustad, uh, so that we can actually go together. Okay. All right. So salam and hello, ustaza. Hello. During the first lesson, I asked if it's possible for me to be the toxic person. Or problem in my life. I learned from you that we should treat ourselves kindly and with lots of love. Thank you for that. Recently, I found out that I am in my first trimester. Do you or can you share with us some tips to, for a new bee mum and a dua to make it an easier journey? Ah, mashallah. First and foremost, congratulations. The bet okay can. I think it's the battery. I on back here. It's blinking anyway. Okay can. So uh, first and foremost, congratulations. Bismillah. Okay, can you hear? Okay. All right. First and foremost, congratulations. This is the third time I'm congratulating you really. Okay. But Alhamdulillah, uh, you're in your first trimester. And Alhamdulillah, um, from the first lesson, we talk about toxic person also, right? Treat ourselves kindly. Uh, I'm happy that you learned that. Uh, it's something that I'm also learning. I cannot change people. I can change myself. And how happy I am today, how contented I am today, it depends on me. Because when I start to focus on myself, I become a happier person. When I focus on others, I cannot change them. I become very frustrated. I become very stressed. And I really cannot change. Also, the, whatever happened in Palestine, for example, you kind of thinking of other people, you can't change them. Right? And when I was with the Palestinians, one thing I realized is that they don't focus on those people that they cannot change. They focus on themselves. In Aqsa, they have people who treat them like really rubbish around there. But when I ask them, how come you're so patient? We Palestinians are patient. They are just so patient. That means they work within themselves. I don't care who you are. And he, he told me, why should we be scared of them? We have Allah. We are only scared of Allah. 
you know the kind of strength they have like wow amazing mashallah so i guess um thank you for bringing this up also and to all of you also this is something that i'm also working on myself focus on yourself you cannot change your parents you cannot change your husband you cannot change anyone you can change yourself all right and the moment you change yourself you start the ripple effect the peace emanates when you have peace inside yourself inshallah it will emanate people around you will feel at peace when you are at peace people around you will feel at peace and everything else you will look at things the problem might be there but you are able to see things clearly because you are at peace with yourself this is the most important thing okay so share some tips as a newbie mom i must rewind 5 years ago newbie mom means i must rewind 14 years ago 15 years ago what's it? some tips ah some tips uh don't care about others don't bother about what people say focus on yourself focus on connecting with allah subhanahu wa taala always talk to your baby always talk to allah from the when the baby is in the womb always have a connection with allah ya allah thank you for this child ya allah ya allah i put this child in your care ya allah how this child is going to grow how healthy this child is whatever gender he is or she is i put him i entrust him with you ya allah take care of him ya allah so you know that allah is taking care of your your child and when you have this connection it will stays with you until you give birth to the child when you give birth to the child when you are delivering your child you will find this strong connection with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there was nothing that can console me when i had my contraction other than the word allah allah ya allah knowing that even my husband don't know what kind of pain i'm going through <laughs> but allah knows what kind of pain i'm going through right so it's like ya allah ya allah only having allah beside me with me it helps me to go through and when you have allah with you you know allah is taking care of you whatever kind of delivery you have it doesn't matter all right try to shut things which are try to see what people tell you if you are a newbie mom some people might tell you do this do that drink soya bean your child will be fair do not drink kopi o your child will be dark uh do not eat uh spicy food because i don't know whatever <laughs> there are certain things that people tell you you have to know what's right and what's wrong okay if someone tell you something just smile okay i have people telling me to bring scissors bring scissors bring needle when i'm a new mother you must bring you know ah paku i heard that needle apa paku is what nail you know why must bring when you are pregnant because according to them when you are pregnant you might be disturbed by the most can sit ah most can sit not can ah pontiana <laughs> so they believe that this pontiana because they they become pontiana because of you know they maybe they died during their childbirth and all that so when you are pregnant they would try to harm and take your child so they will ask you to bring this sharp thing with you now i was told that and i was like ah huh? yeah whatever she's an elderly i just smile it off and just khalas okay i i don't want to talk about it because there are some people you can tell that is khurafat There are some people at that time I was a young mother nobody's going to listen to me I'm no ustaza or what I'm just a young girl lady I was 25 nobody's going to listen to me so I say okay just smile so these are things that you need to know what you can do and what you cannot do the moment you give birth um there will be a lot of people who also tell you things uh, maybe this makcik will tell you swaddle like that mak this makcik tell you swaddle like that this machi tell you must tie one knot like that right mummies have you gone through that and you are so and then you read up babies no need to be swaddled <laughs> then you like ah oh, i've gotten so many people about this generational gap between how to take care of children right this cause a lot of friction between parents parents in laws and children because we we find that this is the way to do it now because we have the knowledge but our parents and parents in laws they find that this is the way to do it okay and so if you are too rigid here there is they are not going to accept it i give you an example 
they are there are a lot of other examples. Okay, for example, breastfeeding. We learn that when you breastfeed the child, you don't have to give water, right? For exclusive breastfeeding, breast milk also has water. Okay, but it's an issue when older parents said that you must give water. If not, the child cannot go toilet. Child never go toilet, so what diapers? But then you must give water. And then the older generation will give water with, um, you know, this winter melon sugar. Yeah, all right. And then you studied that that winter melon sugar is actually contaminated. So cannot give to babies. So these are things that will happen, you know. It, like, really, this real, real scenarios, real things that are going to happen. So you need to, from the start, tell yourself, if people are going to tell you things, you need to be able to see it. Just see it. If it, why are they calling me non-stop? Okay, so okay. But um, you need to be able to see whatever that is not, not like things which are. Um, these are these can be toxic, you know. These can be things that they, they, they tell you. Just smile, leave it out, press the delete button. My husband always teach me this. We ladies, right? We find it sometimes things bother us. We will think about it, correct? Right, the whole day think about it. Correct or not? Or is it me? Am I the only lady here? No, right? Oh, right, we try to think, 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 then you play back, you play back, you play back, you play back. Then you realize that your one whole day you wasted your time spoiling your whole mood because of that one thing. Of that one person who looked at you and said you met at the wedding, and that person said, Wow, you gained weight already, yeah? Tell you the whole day is gone, your whole mood is just gone just because of that one comment. How many of you felt that before? Correct or not? Right. Some people come to me, uh, I, I hate it when people come, touch my stomach. Number five. Uh. <laughs> Alamak. Pregnant. Uh. I don't know, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> you know? I used to be so skinny, but now I'm not that skinny. But you don't have to touch people's stomach and ask, right? Got something. Uh. You know, like, oh my God, subhanAllah. And you're just like, you will play back in my mind. I'm a normal human, right? Like, play back in my mind. Am I fat? I'll tell my husband, am I fat? Am I fat? And I don't know how many times he must say, no, you're very beautiful. You're the most beautiful. I don't know how many times he must say that just because... And then when he said, also, we don't believe, you know? I'm fat. <laughs> I'm fat. Oh, because I give birth. <laughs> you know, we start to think like that. So my husband always teach me this. Okay? Dear, press the delete button. <laughs> he will tell me, press the delete button. Click on it. Delete. This thing is not supposed to be in your mind. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your effort thinking of something that people tell you because you can go crazy. All right? These people, they got nothing better to do. They tell you these things. Delete. And, and I think that that is one advice that I really appreciate. So now, when I'm bothered about something, I will remember what he said. Delete. Click. Out. <laughs> Out of my mind. I'm not going to put you in my mind. Okay? You need to put that. Ladies. Okay? So you really need to press the delete button. When your baby is born, um, there are other things that you will face. When the type of delivery that you deliver your baby, if you go C-sec, when, you know, uh, my first child was born by C-sec because she was breech. I was a breech baby. Uh, butt down. I was also butt down. Okay? And when I had to go for C-sec, after my C-sec, I was very, already demoralized. I didn't get a natural birth. Then someone came to me, a guy, and a, a relative, and he came to me and he told me this. It's not the same, huh? uh, you know, going through C-sec and uh, normal birth. Because uh, normal birth, you feel the motherly feeling. Okay, because his wife went through normal. Uh. He never even go through anything. <laughs> then he wants to tell me that. But at that moment, I felt like I'm already feeling horrible as a mother because I had to go to C-sec. And then, this guy come and tell me this. And then I'm struggling with my breast milk. Okay? And then, uh, people come and tell me, I was only 48 kilo. So people ask me, you sure you got enough milk? Not? Because you look very thin. Okay? 
So I'm doubting whether I got enough milk or not. Already like, I'm going crazy. First time mother, child got jaundice. And then don't know whether got enough milk or not. And then every time the baby, here I am struggling with breastfeeding. When, whenever my child cries, someone come to take my child or my child cry, I think she got not enough milk. I think she's still hungry. You know, that kind of thing. Mommy, have you gone through this? I'm telling you, there was a time I felt when, when Nafisa cried at that spot of a moment, I felt like taking her and I felt like throwing her down. I really felt that I had, I had fever also. I was so stressed. Until now, whenever I heard or, I mean, or people come to me, or even last year, there were two cases of mother jumping down with a baby. Postnatal depression is real. I will have flashbacks. I will remember how I felt like throwing my child. And it's really true. People don't understand unless you go through it. Because the stress is, wow, <laughs> the stress, especially for a new time mother, or a new mother, all right? So be very nice to mothers. Please don't uh, ask them questions like, C-sec or natural? Uh, epidural got take, no? Epidural. You take, ah? I never take, no? I got 10 children, never take epidural. <laughs> Uh, people don't need to know whether you take or not. <laughs> no need to feel so great. So what if that person take epidural? So what if the person c sec My second one was also c sec because it was a slow birth. And in the end, my third and fourth, I changed um, hospital. I hated that hospital. I hated that gynae because that gynae is really so horrible to me. I had a very traumatic birth. I, she was operating on me, and when she wanted to operate, she asked me, ligation, ah? ligation? One ligation? Maybe she wants to cut my fallopian tube at the uh, operation theatre. <laughs> then I was like, no, I didn't even sign anything. Then after I gave birth, she scolded me. After she stitched me up, she scolded me and said, third one, uh, operation. Because uh. I was trying for a natural birth and she was so impatient with me. I got a very traumatic birth. And then I went to another hospital. I went to NUH. Okay? I went to Dr. Chitra. Have you heard of Dr. Chitra Mata? Dr. Chitra Mata is a blessing. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah, I gave birth naturally for Zaid and I gave birth naturally for Nusaiba. And people thought, eh, how come she said can go natural? So, and people tell me, oh, natural babies, uh, they are smarter, you know. Uh, they don't fall sick. Who tell you that? No, she said because they have pressure. I don't know, they never go through the pressure. And I will get very upset when people tell me that. You don't compare between my children. And if you have issue with C-sec babies, I was born by C-sec. You got a problem with me? <laughs> Am I less smart? Do you think I'm not smart? Like, what's your problem? Why do you need to say things like that to make a mother feel horrible? How she delivered the baby. There are a lot of times that things are not within their control. And sometimes a mother cannot even breastfeed the baby. You don't think like, oh, I breastfed everyone, you know, every one, three years. Okay, fine, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave you that. Not every mother has that capability. So, this is the things that advices that you ask me, right? So, I'm telling you, people will come even until today and tell you how you should be a good mother. But you should listen to yourself and you trust your instinct. You yourself are a good mother. Trust me. No need. People will tell you 1,001 things, rubbish things. I put my children inside madrasa so people tell me, your children got future, ah? Like, what future are you talking about? Like, you know, uh, no, uh, madrasa, the system, uh, uh, how do you know? I said, you know, like every time, even I switch, people tell my mother, you crazy, uh, your daughter go to Islamic line. Later, your daughter will not have future, you know. The pay not that good, you know. Like, people tell my mother that about me, okay. Uh, whatever they say, lah. <laughs> okay, so it's um, learn how to listen to yourself. This is not only for the new mother. I pray that you have a, a safe, what you call that, pregnancy and safe delivery, inshallah. And I also pray for every one of you here, inshallah, for those of you who have not yet become mothers, I pray that one day, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you that blessing of become a mother, inshallah, have children, amin, ya Rabb. And also for those of you who are already mothers, uh, May Allah SWT help us because really motherhood is something that you will learn a lot, you will struggle a lot, but it will shape you to be a woman that you never thought you were. Lah. I, I will not be like that today if not for my four children. Okay? If in any case, 
your pregnancy ends, any one of you was pregnant, if any case ends and have you have to terminate your pregnancy, then it's the best. It's for the best. I had to, and I talk big pregnancy. I talk big pregnancy means the baby is at the, not the baby, the, the sac is at the fallopian tube or at the C-sac scar. Mine was at C-sac scar. So do you, can you imagine, I already ho feel horrible, I had a C-sac, and then the, um, the next pregnancy, it was clinging at my C-sac scar. So who was I blaming? Myself. I was blaming, I had to terminate the pregnancy, because if not, I would die. It, it cannot be there. So I was blaming myself, I went through another kind of hormonal change, because I was uh, injected by MTX, I went crazy. I'm telling you, this is what happened to me. You say, well, Ustazah so calm. No, I was not calm. So I'm telling you, be prepared. Motherhood will make you crazy. <laughs> it will make you go through a roller coaster of emotions that you never know that you can be like that. It can, it can drive you to the craziest part of you. And I've been there so many times. So many times, subhanAllah. So, and the hormone, hormonal changes, you cry for no reason. I have mothers who want to abort the babies the third babies, the fifth babies, right? So if you know, this is not because the mother doesn't bother or doesn't care, but it's because of hormonal changes. So you are pregnant, you have hormonal changes, embrace that. Embrace that. If you start crying for no reason, it's okay, it's normal. You're not weak. It's part of being a woman, all right? It's part of being a woman. So enjoy your pregnancy, the one who's asking me this. Anyone else of you pregnant? Anyone? Uh, anyone who wants to be pregnant? Let's do for them. May Allah SWT grant you the rezeki. Amin. Amin. Inshallah. Amin. Amin. For those of you, inshallah, in this blessed month of Ramadan, I make dua for those of you who are trying to have a child. May Allah SWT give you righteous children, inshallah. Amin. At the soonest time, inshallah. For those of you who don't want to become pregnant anymore, anyone? Anyone who don't want to become pregnant, I want to raise up my hand. <laughs> anyone? I make dua that is enough. <laughs> Factory is closed. Allah give opportunities to other people, inshallah. Okay? Alright, anyone else who want to ask question? Yes. Up to what age the father can give? Bath to their baby. Oh, okay. Um... Daughters lah. Is it? Daughters. Okay. Most, because I have my own daughters, right? At the age of, I mean, now she's five years old. She's already, I'm teaching her haya, some shame. So even four years old, they are already vocal and they are already, they know, you know, that fathers cannot uh, really be with them. So for my children, at the age of about three, at the age of about three, the daughters, it's me and my daughter already, uh, my elder daughter who's actually uh, changing her and all that. Unless, of course, there are situations where no one else is there. When no one else is there, then my husband will come in. All right, my husband will come in. And that is also because I trust my husband. Because there are issues where uh, you need to know your own husbands also. Because there are issues where also there are. Men who take advantage and then of even their own daughters. Okay, even their own daughters. So, if for me, uh, at the age of three, for me, it's the cut off uh, at the age of three. But for women towards sons, okay, it's quite different. Women towards sons, I would say at the age of six or seven. Six or seven. So, my son is seven. Uh, he's already bathing himself, know how to eat stinja and all that. So, I'm, I'm no longer in the toilet with him. Unless emergency lah. Then I'm the mother, I have to go inside. Okay? But now he's bathing himself. But for daughters, it's, it starts a bit more earlier. Alright? About three years old. Then I think that's when the father also need to take a step back lah. Because, uh, you know, there's uh, private parts involved and all that. For, for babies, for young babies, it's okay for fathers to actually bathe the babies. My husband bathe all my children. <laughs> My husband, I teach him, better learn. <laughs> okay, better learn to son. And he bathed my, my daughters, my, my sons. I bathe them myself. Even after, even after I give birth, immediately after giving birth, I actually bathe my children. <laughs> so, and I teach my husband to bathe. So, no, no issues with that. 
I cannot hear what? Can the father shower with the baby? How old is the baby? That means the heart, okay, sorry to say this, but the, the father is naked. Yeah. Ah, no. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. <laughs> I wouldn't let it happen even to my family, even though I trust my husband. Because I feel like, I mean, if he's dressed, or if he's sarong or whatever, lah, bermudas, at least something. Lah. But like, bathing with the babies, I don't think so. That means uh, he's exposed. And then you bathe with a baby, I don't think uh, that is permissible. And I think it's not right also. Looks kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, cannot. I don't think so. Even for mothers, mothers also, you don't bathe with your two-year-old son. Uh, never mind, uh, it's okay, my son. No, I mean, you have to have some kind of boundaries. Okay? You, when you bathe them, at least, because they know, they know everything. Even for breastfeeding. Breastfeeding, uh, there are some people who will not allow you to breastfeed the babies from two or three years old onward, okay, because of our right issues. I personally breastfeed my son for two and a half years, Ammar. For Zaid, it's about three years because it was difficult. I was tandem nursing with Nusaiba, all right? It was not easy to quit because Zaid is naturally very clingy to me. So I was breastfeeding him for three years. It was not easy. I tried. Then only I able. For my girls, it was easier. Less than two years already, they don't want. My girls are a bit more independent. Okay, I can drink other things, fresh milk, you know. But my boys are a bit longer. So, uh, but I need to take uh, into consideration the aurat issue. That's why I tried to tell Zaid, no, Zaid, stop. Zaid, stop. You have to try to stop. Alhamdulillah, he stopped before three lah. But if you go on seven, eight years old, I know there are people who are still breastfeed their child for seven to eight years old. I don't know. For me personally, I cannot. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else? Anything else? Yes. Hmm. Our what? Okay, can. All right. I want to teach you one dua. This is the dua that I shared uh, yesterday uh, when we had a forum with um, Siti Noaliza. And I shared this dua and I told them that I will post this dua uh, in my Facebook. So if you cannot. Uh, what you call that, you cannot note down here. I will share it at my Facebook. Eh, sorry, not Facebook, Instagram. My Facebook is dead. Lah. Okay. So for those of you who have not followed my Instagram, follow there. I will update there. Even the class here continue or not, I will update at my Instagram. Okay, if not, follow my Telegram. Okay, but Instagram, I'm more active there. Now I'm going to teach you this dua. And this dua is a very, very beautiful dua. And uh, you might have heard this dua. This dua, it's the, 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 uh, the sound of the dua is this. Ya hayyu ya qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith, aslih li sha'ni kullah, wa la takilni ila nafsi tarfata'in. Have you heard of this dua before? You heard of this? I, I go slowly. Eh? Ya hayyu ya qayyum. Hayyu and qayyum, these are, these are names of Allah. Hayyu means the one that lives, ever live. Alright, and koyum means the one that stands on his own. Alright, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never fail you. You are asking Allah who will never fail you. You are asking Allah who will never die. If you depend on your husband or you depend on someone and that person has a possibility that that person can leave you and die. But if you depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is hai, Allah is koyum, Allah will never die. Okay, and if you depend on your husband, and your husband sometimes cannot provide you what you need, 
You depend on your parents. Your parents sometimes cannot provide you what you need, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He stands on His own. Qayyum. He doesn't need anyone else. So when you ask Allah, you are reminding yourself that you are asking the one that can give you anything you want, that can help you. Ya hayyun, ya qayyum. Okay? Bi rahmatika astaghith. With your rahma, ya Allah, with your mercy, ya Allah, astaghith. Astaghith means um, I seek your help. I'm pleading for your help. Okay, that means whatever issues that you have right now, each one of us, we have our own set of problems. It's different, it's unique. All right? We ask Allah, Ya Allah, Bi rahmatika astaghith, Ya hayu ya qayyum, Bi rahmatika astaghith. You are saying astaghith means shower. Astaghith, shower us with your ghaythun. Ya, shower us with your help. Help, that means we are pleading with Allah. We are really pleading for Allah. Ya Allah, help us, Ya Allah. Help us, Ya Allah. We are in this problem, Ya Allah. I have these issues, Ya Allah. I do not know how to come out from these issues, Ya Allah. This is birahmatika astaghith. Aslih li. Aslih. Ah, the mosque at uh, Punggol. What is it called? Masjid. Islah. The word aslih comes from the word islah. Amalan saliha comes from the word islah. Aslih means rectify, make better. Alright? So make better. Aslih li, rectify for me, li, sha'ni kulla. Sha'ni is my affairs. Sha'ni is my affairs, kullahu, everything. So you are asking Allah to rectify your affairs, all your affairs. It doesn't matter whether it's your financial affairs, whether it's your marriage, whether you you're in your parenting, whether you as children, whether you at work, you are asking Allah to rectify it. And who are you asking? Ya hayyu ya qayyum. Okay, the one who will never ever fail you, the one who will never ever abandon you. Okay? And then you continue and says, "Wala takilni ila nafsi." Do not leave or do not leave myself, or do not entrust to myself, tarfata ainin, even for a blink. That means do not leave me alone. It's like a child telling the mummy, don't even leave me out of your sight. You know, look at me, I, I, need, I need you to be with me. You are telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even for a blink, ya Allah, do not leave me aside. Do not leave me aside. That means everything that I do, everything, even when I'm parenting my children, even in my marriage, be with me. Okay? This dua is one of my favorite dua. Ya hayyu ya qayyum. Ya hayyu ya qayyum. Ya hayyu ya qayyum. You can say it three times until you internalize who is ya hayyu ya qayyum. Bi rahmatika astaghith. Ya Allah, with your mercy, ya Allah, I'm pleading with you, ya Allah. Help me, ya Allah. Help me, ya Allah. Aslih li sha'ni kullah. Rectify for me all my affairs, ya Allah. Wala takilni ila nafsi tarfata'in. And do not leave me, ya Allah, even with a blink of an eye. Okay, so this dua is a dua in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is what uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told Sayyidina Fatima to uh, practice every morning and every evening. All right, every morning and every evening. So you can read this dua. Okay, have you memorized the dua? No. Okay, can we read it together? One, two, three. Ya hayyu ya qayyum. I know you all are fasting lah. But then, last one already. After this, can go already. After this, can go makan. Want to go makan? Okay. Ya hayyu ya qayyum. Ya hayyu ya qayyum. Bi rahmatika astaghith. Bi rahmatika astaghith Aslih li Sha'ni kullah Wala takilni Ila nafsi Tarfata'inin Is it a bit mouthful? A bit? 
Okay, I will write this in my post. I will post with the transliteration so that you are able to read it also, not only the Arabic one and the meaning. Okay, so this is what the Prophet Sallallahu tell us to read whenever we feel down, whenever we feel that we cannot handle something. All right, and trust me, I was just talking to my friend yesterday. I met a friend. This friend of mine, she's very close to me. She just lost a husband. Husband very young, had cancer. Just a few months ago, lost husband. So she came yesterday. She said, I come to see you. You know, and I didn't have time to see her. I felt so bad, subhanAllah. And then she talked to me and she said, you know, whatever you say is true. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us this kind of test, the only thing that can comfort, uh, comfort us is when we know Allah is there for us. Allah ma'ana. That's the only thing. She said that is the only thing that matter and that's the only thing that comfort us. So now the same thing I'm telling you, when we are at our lowest moment, there's nothing that can comfort us other than the fact that we know Allah is there and making sure that everything is fine for us. So when we ask Allah, ask lihli sha'ni kullah, we are asking Allah to make our affairs good, to rectify. You are asking Allah, you know. How can you have doubt of, in Allah? You have yakin in Allah. You must have that yakin. I've already asked Allah to not leave me alone and I've already asked Allah to rectify my affairs. I have no doubt that Allah is listening to my dua and Allah is making sure that everything is good for me. And even when after you read this dua and you are like waiting, say, Muni, nothing, Muni, my affairs, Allah not answering. No, 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 no. There's something that Allah wants to teach you. Patience. Perhaps Allah wants to teach you something. You cannot expect the problem to be gone. Right? I told you I lost my bag, right? I didn't get my bag until now. I lost 1,000 USD. I lost my bag. My bag is a branded bag. I branded wallet. All gone. My IC is gone. I got a bank card now. You know, like I, I had, my bank card was gone. I didn't get it. I was on a humanitarian trip. I was on a humanitarian trip. I was on the way to go Aqsa and and uh, Umrah Ramadan. I could have said, Ya Allah, I do so much. Why you give me this bad thing? Correct or not? It's not that I do something bad. What? Why you do give me this? But I know that it happened for a reason. Until now, I didn't get. I told, Ya Allah, bring it back to me. If it's meant for me, bring it back to me. Bring it back to me. It didn't come back to me. So can I think, Allah never answer my dua. I make dua, I do so much, so good, so Allah never answer. No, Allah is listening. There is a hikmah why it happened. I cannot comprehend it. I don't understand. The, the problem is still there. Okay, it doesn't change the problem. But I know that Allah SWT is not uh, giving me what I want because there is a lesson for me. I need to look back at myself. And you know what lesson do I have? I have the lesson of Ridha. I have the lesson of this is the color and qadar of Allah. It was written for it to be lost. It was written for someone to take it. And I have to learn how to read it. I have to learn that this is all dunya. I have to learn to let go of my... These are things. Money is gone. So what money is gone? Alhamdulillah, I'm alive. Alhamdulillah, my husband is alive. Alhamdulillah, the whole team is alive. The plane did not crash. Alhamdulillah, my children are alive. My children are well and fine. There are so many things that I can be happy about and be contented about. So this is what perhaps Allah wants to teach me. Okay? So you cannot change the problem, but you can change your perspective. Remember I told you, the glass of water, the lizard dropping. You won't drink the water if there's a lizard dropping. Correct? But if the lizard dropping is in the ocean, it does not affect the ocean. You can even use the water in the sea to make your ablution, even if one container of pig you know, or pork <laughs> fall into the sea, the whole sea is still pure for you to take your ablution. Right? So we cannot change the problem. The problem might be there, like the dropping. Okay, or the problem might become bigger, like the, the big container of pig or pork. Right? But we ask Allah to expand ourselves. Rabbi Shrahli Sadri. The problem might be there, but we are able to handle it well and we are able to not let ourselves be affected by that one thing. Alright? So, Alhamdulillah. Any other things before I wrap up? All okay? Alhamdulillah. So, I'm going to share this, uh, this uh, dua in my Instagram, inshallah. And I have a few other uh, videos that we 
uh, about Ramadan. So we are going. I'm going to post it. If not after Ramadan, then post then basi ready lah. You know, it's basi. Uh, so we post it inshallah. So hopefully, alhamdulillah, all of you get the benefits uh, of joining this class, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala multiply your reward for coming on a Sunday morning to attend classes. Alhamdulillah. Make your doa in this mosque. It's a very blessed place. Malaikat is here. Every majlisul ilm, there's malaikat, there's angels to say amin to your doa. So make lots of doa, especially when you are fasting in Ramadan. Okay. So all the best. We only have a few more days left in Ramadan. Make the full use of it. Um, do whatever you can. If you have your menstruation, do lots of zikir, read up, do anything, do any good that you can to anyone. Anything, any opportunity you can. I want to share this with you. Okay, this is not Ria, but I think I want to share this with you. I was walking at Century Square. Why did I go to Century Square? I don't know. Oh, bank, DBS bank. I have for, to make my company bank card because I lost it. Came down, I saw a makci at the, you know, they got the relaxing chair. So this makci, she was putting down her things, finding money to put for the relaxing chair. And I was just walking down the escalator, so I saw. And I saw that, that was like an opportunity for us to do good, right? So I stopped, I said, Assalamualaikum, Cik. <laughs> yeah, nak urut? Uh, I said, ah, ah, nak urut, nak urut. She doesn't know me, uh. I think she doesn't know me. Alhamdulillah, she doesn't know me. Because wherever I go, DBS Bank, all everything, Saza, we know you, Miss Saza, we know you. I was like, Ma, no privacy. This one, this Ma, don't know me. So I said, uh, Cik, uh, nak urut eh? Uh, cik nak mana satu? Nak dua dolar, lima dolar dengan sepuluh dolar. Lah, cik nak lima dolar ni. Lima dolar is fifteen minutes. Five dollars is fifteen minutes. So, I said, uh, off record lah, uh, don't record this. I mean, don't need to put that. I just want to share with you. I'm, I'm not sharing with you like how good I am. I just want to share with you that kind of, just do good lah. Uh. And I was like, okay, okay. I look at my wallet. I don't have much notes lah. Uh, but I have a five dollar there. And I said, nini cik nak, I put for you. Nanti cik urut dia, eh, terima kasih, terima kasih. And that's it, and I just walk off. And I was like, what the heck did I just did? Pay $5 for makcik to urut. But I'm sharing this with you to tell you, just find anything good lah. <laughs> you can help that makcik to urut and enjoy 15 minutes or so. Ah. Just do it lah. Okay, so I just want to share this with you. Like, these next few days, right, instead of focusing on how many taraweh, how many things, just do good. Now you go out. What, what can you do to make people's life better? Then you just five dollars, two dollars, two things. So just do it lah. Bismillah. Wake up for saho. Do something. Do something grand. Oh yeah, one more tip I want to tell you. Give Raya money now. If you can. I don't know why, who came up with this culture of giving Hari Raya money. It should be Ramadan money. <laughs> Okay, must start the culture of Ramadan money. So I gave my parents their Hari Raya money already on the 25th night or 23rd night. I, I don't know, I just gave. I, and I have this culture of giving my parents uh, monthly money on a Friday. On a Friday. I don't know why. But I feel like it's baraka. So I will always wait on the first Friday of the month and I will give my parents money. My husband gave his parents money yesterday on the 27th night. So uh, I said, okay, alhamdulillah. So we give the Hari Raya money. So if you can give, give now. Because there's more baraka now. There's more reward now. You give on the first day of Hari Raya, not so much. Okay? So if you want to give, give. More so-so, you want to give, give now. Later so give lah. Okay? Uh, so bismillah. So try to find all this and try to give as much charity as you can. In Surah Al-Munafiqun, Allah talk about someone who pleaded with Allah these people in the grave, they pleaded with Allah to let them live for just a few seconds. Just a few minutes, just a while. And they said they want to live for a while because they want to do charity. So it tells us that the people in Jalan Baha now, if they are given an opportunity to wake up, the first thing that they will do is not solat. The first thing they will do is not anything else. The first thing they will do is to give charity. It shows to us how huge charity is. So do waste the opportunity. Give to anyone you can. Alright? Okay. Bismillah. So find makcik-makcik urut. Eh? Uh. After this, want to sponsor my urut also can. Uh. Yeah. Then just do like, oh, today you tell your mother. You tell your mother, Mak, you tired not? I belanja you urut. 
two hours at a spa. Wow, before you cook for Hari Raya. <laughs> okay, something like that. Do something good for your parents. Go and belanja them food or, you know, come, I want to uh, give you a good massage. I pay for you, this kind of thing. Okay, all right. Alhamdulillah, uh, or pay it forward. One last thing, eh? pay it forward. Go to any bazaar, uh, give $50. Machi, I want uh, how many bottles of water? I pay $50. So one bottle is one dollar. The next fifty people that come, give them free. Give them free. That is called pay it forward. Okay. So you go to any bazaar or whatever. You pay fifty dollars this much, fifty dollars this much, hundred dollars this much. How many people do you provide water and iftar for? Subhanallah. It's beautiful. These are things that you can do. Don't go Starbucks lah. Okay. Don't go. Go other places. Uh, can? Can I? Inshallah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, I thank you for coming here also to support me. Have you taken a picture, Khalisa? No, I still don't know how to take a picture. It's too big, is it, to take a picture? Yeah, maybe you take from the back. Uh, you take from the back here. Mm. Okay, so we take a picture, inshallah. And I thank you, everyone. And uh, we end, uh, inshallah, uh, with Tasbih Kafar Asad al Ans. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Subhanakallah. Bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wal ansar innal insana lafi khusr Ilal ladhina aman wa amil salihat Wa tawasaw bil haq Wa tawasaw bil sabr InsyaAllah uh, Before we move uh, We just take a picture A group picture A nice one Then after that we are done Where are the crowd? Hayya Until there, right? Hayya salam Can you move here a bit? Okay, can you move here? Can you move here? Sam, let's take a picture.